Hi and welcome to today's meetup, Kafka on Kubernetes here at Forefront Consulting. My name is Eric Forslid and I work as team manager for the integration team here. And uh, this team consists of 25 system developers and system architects. And this is my colleague Max. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, nice to be here tonight. Uh, so much fun that we can keep uh, things moving along, even though we are quite uh, isolated socially. Uh, so uh, we're very happy to do this tonight. And I'm, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to work with all these people that are, that are going to be speaking with you tonight. Uh, I'm in charge of systems development at Forefront in Stockholm. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take you through a brief intro before we run through the agenda. And then we will start the sessions. So, Forefront, uh, we're uh, quite a large company nowadays. We're about 400 people. Uh, we do a lot of work with, uh, in three different areas, uh, management uh, consulting. We do uh, work with uh, uh, our division channels that uh, do more uh, user experience stuff. And then we have technology, which is represented here tonight. So that's basically a, a quick run through of our, our business. What we do in technology is quite a wide scope. Uh, we uh, are obviously focused on technical development and tonight we're going to be speaking about three areas. Uh, we're going to be doing some data integration and event streaming uh, commentary and then we're going to talk a little bit about integration in general and we're also going to be talking quite a lot about platform and uh, Kubernetes. So. Uh, that's about it for uh, the technology side. Um, we have a strong belief in teamwork and um, uh, I like this quote by Steve Jobs that uh, my model for business is the Beatles. They're done by one person, they're always done by a team. And that's very much the philosophy we have together with our customers and the speakers tonight and what we do on an everyday basis. So it makes work quite a bit more fun. Uh, so uh, basically we focus on the implementation level when it comes to technology uh, and the other part that we also have a lot of fun with is of course innovation and uh, some of the uh, stuff we're going to be talking about tonight uh, is about uh, feature to production cycles and how we get them moving fast and precise uh, and this requires always, at least in our uh, mind, a uh, uh, trade-off between uh, value on the one side and uh, learning on the other side. And we need to get that trade-off right to, to create value from all this fun technology. Uh, so uh, tonight also we have the great pleasure to announce uh, our collaboration with Red Hat. Uh, this has been an ongoing work for um, the past uh, five years or so. Uh, and we're, we keep getting better all the time. And Red Hat also moves a lot of uh, exciting technology to the market. So um, uh, the Red Hat mission uh, is create better technology the open source way, which rhymes very much with what we like to do, which is to guide organizations through the digital landscape. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, collaboration with Stackliter, who have some of the speaking slots tonight and particularly in the area of uh, Kubernetes where, where there is uh, a lot of technical challenges and we need to pull together to make successful cases. So just to run through the agenda a little bit, um, we uh, are doing the welcome session right now. Just shortly we'll be starting and uh, the first session will be from legacy integration to Kafka on Kubernetes and uh, a little fun commentary on in that area is that this is the first mover application area for for IKEA so we're kind of uh, 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 overcoming some of the initial challenges finding solutions and making things work in a in a better way together uh, after that we have cloud the great pleasure of uh, Klaus Ibsen will be speaking and uh, in, in his uh, mr. mr. camel at least in my view uh, and uh, run through some of the innovative uh, solutions coming out of, of Red Hat and how we can make them work. Uh, and then uh, finally, we'll be talking about Kubernetes uh, uh, as a managed service at Scania. Uh, and that we look forward to as well. All of these uh, presentations will be run as playback. And then we will have some Q&A session that will be more live uh, after each session. So please make commentary in the, in the commentary field and ask questions and then we'll gather them up and we'll address them uh, in a live manner. So we're 
kind of semi-live because all the recordings were done yesterday. And uh, just to, uh, to mention, it was a bit of a challenge to, to reset this whole event from, from the traditional live meetup that we usually do to this, uh, this uh, format. Uh, and uh, it looks likely we're going to be trying to do that a couple of more times before this uh, corona scare is over. So bear with us. And thanks all everyone for joining. Uh, so let's try and make it as interactive as we can. And don't hesitate to send us uh, any suggestions on how we can improve as well. Uh, so how do we do this? Presentations are mostly pre-recorded, as I mentioned. Uh, speakers are available for Q&A live afterwards. Uh, we would love if you have some questions for us. Uh, and then we will reply to them in the short breaks in between. And if you want uh, our materials, uh, we're happy to send them out. Just drop us an email, max.olson at forefront.se. Uh, we can also have individual sessions if anybody is interested in that afterwards or some other time point. So that's about it from me, and I hope we all have a fun uh, night together. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> the first up is uh, Gustav with the case at IKEA. Welcome to this talk about uh, moving from legacy middleware to Kafka on Kubernetes at uh, Ica. And yeah, I think you all heard about Ica before. It's uh, Sweden's largest grocery retail company. And uh, I would like to talk about how we introduced Kafka as an enterprise integration platform there. Uh, I will take you through how the project started in the beginning and sort of focused on a value-driven lean approach. And we will go through sort of the initial requirements, move up until where we are today and even take a little glance on the future. So, yeah, uh, my name is Gustav Norbecker and I'm a consultant at Forefront. Uh, I'm a software architect uh, working mostly with system integration and has been so for sort of 10 years. Uh, I've been working a lot with Kafka for the last couple of years and uh, mostly helping customers to introduce Kafka uh, all the way from deployment of actual product to architecture moving on to sort of education and even some governance. Been working mostly in the banking and retail sector and you'll find my sort of email at the bottom there if you want to reach out and ask me something. Yeah, so let's start from the beginning and look a little bit on the sort of requirements. Ica was sort of growing out of its current integration platform and looking to sort of deploy a, a new platform with the following requirements. They wanted sort of an enterprise platform that scales for the whole organization. Uh, they wanted to accommodate for use cases with pretty high demand on actual throughput and processing. Uh, an ability to sort of promise near 100% uptime and strong delivery guarantees, sort of like uh, exactly one semantics, was required. Uh, they wanted an ease of integration with the middleware such as BI or Elk, a legacy message broker and, and stuff like that. Uh, they wanted sort of in the longer run to be able to replace much of their current legacy integration platform and all the synchronous flows from that. And preferably they were looking for a platform that was open source. Well, so both we at Forefront and Ica agreed upon that Apache Kafka is a, a really great choice for such a platform. Uh, the choice of the exact packaging of this product had to be sort of investigated further. 
Uh, should we use vanilla Kafka, Confluence, HD Insight, or anything else? Um, looking at the organization, you would already find the architects and developers that already had looked at uh, sort of Kafka and wanted to use it in their sort of projects. Uh, so I guess if you looked around, you will find people also sort of wanting Ika to take this step. So it was actually de decided to uh, go on and evaluate Kafka as a POC, a proof of concept. But I might as well beforehand talk a little bit about what is actually this, what is Kafka? Might, it might be that not all of you have heard of, used, uh, or actually know all the, the, the details of this product. So it actually comes from LinkedIn. It's now a decade ago that it was actually sort of started. Uh, and it was pretty soon found that this was something that could be used by the, the, the greater sort of com community. So it was open sourced already in 2011. By 2014, the founders had actually moved on and started a uh, uh, sort of separate organization to actually make this product uh, enterprise grade. And today we are at Kafka version 2.4, 10 years later. So you can actually handle pretty large uh, sort of setups with Kafka. It's a distributed message broker. And uh, the largest setup today, I guess, is around the figures mentioned here. It's 4,000 brokers uh, set up in a network and actually handling 2.2 trillion messages a day and uh, sort of having six petabytes of storage. I'm, I think it's still at LinkedIn, if, if I'm not wrong. But yeah. That's Kafka, or is it? What, what is it really? Well, it's this message broker that you can sort of deploy and, and run for your whole organization. It will scale almost indefinitely. Uh, you can also look at it other ways. Uh, you could say that it's a stream processing platform, and you can do a lot of uh, fun stuff by looking at all these messages as streams of data, which you can enrich and transform and stuff like that. Uh, I won't actually go too much into that uh, in this talk, but it's still relevant uh, in the Ika case and in other uh, deployments as well. If you're a little bit more technical, you could actually explain it that it's a distributed transaction log. Uh, you, you write to it incrementally, you can consume from it in your own pace, and you can sort of divide it up in millions of different partitions, which could scale horizontally, uh, sort of how much you want. We could sort of mention what it's not as well. Uh, it's a common misconception that it's a database. Kafka is not a database. You read from it sequentially. You can do stuff like query it in some ways, but it's sort of a niche case. And uh, I would say if you need a database, you should get a database. Uh, for this message broker, it's a better choice. I wouldn't either say that it's sort of a smart broker. It's a very fast and high performance broker. If you want to do uh, smart things, you will do that in the clients. So they can handle a lot of sort of that logic and the, the central broker sort of uh, just handles the throughput. But you can sort of mitigate around that. And I don't know if I'm scaring you. I, I won't say Kafka is easy. It's distributed. It's a lot of storage. It's pretty hard to manage. But we will look uh, further on here on how to actually ease that pain. Yeah, so I mentioned a POC. Let's take a quick look on how that sort of started. Uh, while Ika had a fair knowledge of what Kafka actually was and its feature set, they wanted to sort of dive a little bit deeper into the following aspects. So performance-wise, how much data could Kafka actually process in their preferred setup? Uh, 
throughput versus latency. How low could you actually get the latency from producer through Kafka to consumer? And at what cost regarding performance could you get this? So we could actually elaborate and sort of uh, uh, tweak the configuration to, to get a sweet spot. Failure scenarios. Uh, what happens when you actually sort of poke at the, the cluster and bring brokers down? How does that uh, affect performance and delivery uh, guarantees? Uh, how did it actually sort of recover? We had to take a little look on monitoring as well. Did we want to sort of buy a monitoring tool that handles uh, Kafka explicitly, or did we actually want to move on with uh, what we already had at ICA to sort of manage different systems? So by running this POC, we could actually get a good view on how to proceed with the implementation. Uh, we know or knew that what, what was sort of sufficient sizing for ICA's need, we could dive into sort of the hundreds of configuration parameters in Kafka and see what was a good baseline for ICA. And we could sort of decide a little bit more about what sort of package of Kafka to use. Did we, we, I think we actually ended up here saying that we wanted to use a community-based Kafka version, uh, much to minimize uh, sort of startup costs. Uh, and moving on from the POC, we found some additional constraints that was not first part of the POC and actually things that came up later. For starters, ICA was going through a cloud-first initiative. Uh, so they actually wanted to sort of, if a project could be cloud enabled, they probably should. Uh, this wasn't a, a big thing for us. I think Kafka is well suited for the cloud, uh, but we had to sort of see that it could be reached from the whole organization on prem and sort of the new cloud as well, and even some other cloud solutions we, we got prior to this. We evaluated uh, Azure. HD Insight as a way of sort of managing Kafka. Uh, but we found out that it didn't actually sort of offer enough flexibility. Uh, it's pretty hard to configure to the, the needs we actually needed. So we sort of ditched that alternative. But we, what we actually looked on uh, was sort of if you're going to cloud, why not take it one step further and look at containerization? So we actually looked at Kubernetes as well. And Ica was actually offering sort of AKS support as a new constellation. AKS is Azure Kubernetes services. So it's Azure's sort of packaging of Kubernetes. Uh, but we had to sort of figure out then, how do we best run Kafka on Kubernetes? So I guess that's what most of you have been waiting for. Uh, let's bring Kafka to Kubernetes. Um, if you start looking for ways to actually set up Kafka on Kubernetes, you will soon see that there aren't sort of official ways like Helm charts and, and such to actually go on. Uh, and that's basically because the, the right way to do this is by using a Kubernetes operator. And Streamc is one of those. Uh, it's an upstream project of Red Hat AMQ streams. And it's exactly what we want. It's a Kubernetes uh, operator for Apache Kafka. We could also take a look on Confluent. Confluent platform offers sort of the same uh, setup today. But when we looked at this, it wasn't actually readily available. And it isn't neither open source. So we actually continued to, to investigate about Streams. 
OK, so we say that SRIMC is a Kubernetes operator. And what is this operator doing? And what is it actually sort of uh, um, giving us? Well, Kafka is quite complex. Uh, it's a distributed system. It's got a lot of state. So let's take a look at the aspects listed here and see what this operator actually does. If we start by looking at security, we can see that we have Kafka brokers, we have Zookeeper nodes actually perform, performing the distributed quorum and majority voting of a Kafka cluster. And all these nodes and brokers need to communicate with each other. Uh, it's not sort of done in a secure fashion in vanilla Kafka. You can do it, but you need to put in a lot of work. And if you look at Zookeeper, it doesn't even sort of support TLS and other encryption standards. So you have to actually wrap it yourself to do this. And what Streamsy does is actually enforcing this. You can't even opt out of it. Uh, by running it, all sort of communication is crypt encrypted and uh, supported by TLS. Um, it will actually generate all the keys and certificates for you. And even sort of the haze of uh, renewing certificate as they expires is handled automatically. So you just have to sort of push these certificates out to the clients and everything else, else is, is handled automatically. Operating sort of upgrades is essential. Kafka is still evolving rapidly, and you need to upgrade your cluster, I suppose, uh, a few times a year to actually get the latest bug fixes and features. Stuff that actually improves uh, your sort of journey uh, all the way. It's still evolving. Um, hosting Kafka on Kubernetes actually means that you have to manage even more resources now than earlier when you did it on-prem. You now have stateful sets, you have persistent volume claims, pods and services and stuff like that, even smaller sort of pieces. Uh, but all these pieces are actually handled by StreamC, so you, that you don't have to manage them yourself. Uh, upgrades are handled automatically. And this is sort of a multi-phase uh, solution where the, the pods are actually rotated one by one. So you don't get any downtime while doing an upgrade. And you will go through different phases where you upgrade the, the protocol version and then the Kafka version. Uh, it's quite tedious, but all you actually have to do now is sort of manage which versions you want to run, and StreamC takes care of the rest for you. And sort of like I mentioned, um, everything is now configuration. So you declaratively sort of tell uh, Kubernetes and StreamC what you want, and it takes care of setting this up for you. So you can change sort of any configuration you like. And when you push it to Kubernetes, it will be automatically updated for you. Yeah, resources. Uh, Kafka is in need of different resources. You need CPU, you need memory, you need networking and storage. And all these things uh, is also sort of an uh, lean approach where you can actually manage quite easily how much CPU and memory you want your brokers to actually get hold of. Managing disk is even more uh, important, I guess. Uh, as your cluster sort of uh, evolves and you get more and more integrations, your storage capability is also sort of increasing. And uh, this is quite easily done by uh, either dynamically so uh, updating your uh, volume claims, giving them more storage, or if that's not supported by a cloud uh, operator or sort of cloud provider, uh, you can also add more volume as you go, as uh, JBOD is just a bunch of drives uh, where you add uh, volumes and Kafka will sort of distribute the load uh, amongst them. 
it does also support the different storage classes that your provider uh, sort of supports for you. So uh, I've tried out NetApp running Kafka on that. It's uh, a really advanced network storage and it works really fine actually. Uh, regarding your users and topics, uh, users could be sort of your clients uh, using Kafka. And uh, these uh, are handled uh, with custom resource definition in Kubernetes. So you just say what you want and uh, the rest is taken care of. Uh, certificates are generated automatically and uh, what the users are actually supposed to get access to is controlled with ACLs, that's access control lists. Uh, topics are sort of the same. You actually have one configuration for each topic where you set all the, the configuration and names and stuff and that then are, they are created automatically. So looking at this, applying GitOps, for example, upon this is a breeze. Uh, everything you have describing the, the cluster and the topics and users are just configuration. So all you need to actually do is put this configuration in a Git repo and you can manage who can sort of merge to the master branch through pull requests and review those. When things actually get to the master branch, you just push it out to Kubernetes and StreamC will take care of the rest for you. So, uh, talking Kafka to Kubernetes and using these operators to, to, to manage this uh, has actually eased the burden of managing this sort of complex beast a lot. And you can focus about more of a fun stuff. But let's talk a little bit about running integrations on top of Kafka as well. Well, integrations at Ica is centered around their ICC. That's their integration <laughs> competency center. And it's so of one group that handles most of the integrations uh, spanning different domains at Ica. So they are the actual experts on integrations. They have a lot of different integrations. They create and they manage and they own these. And projects actually needing these integrations might not even have a team with these capabilities. It might be integration between different commercial of the shelf uh, available products. So. Uh, it's a pretty good thing to actually have this ICC taking care of them for you. But uh, how do they actually do this on, on Kafka? There are a couple of different ways to do integrations. You could, of course, use your regular Kafka client to connect to and produce and consume messages. It's really fast. It is sort of hardcore. But I mean, if you need a, a little bit more of a complex or you have a complex integration, uh, I think it's the way to go. Uh, if you have a legacy system or some kind of middleware, I would go for using Kafka Connect because that's a way to integrate without actually producing code. You can run it just through configuration. Uh, Kafka REST is just an, a bridge on top of Kafka, sort of, uh, sort of uh, giving access to, to the topics uh, with an easier interface. Not maybe focusing on the highest performance, but it's a, a lightweight or low entry way of actually sort of communicating. But there are a lot of different use cases as well. You might want to do some transformation or some kind of enrichment. How would you actually perform those? Well, Apache Camel have been a lean way of, of creating complex integrations for the last decade or so. And now with Camel 3, so, sort of released, uh, I think it was the last quarter of uh, 2019, uh, offers a containerized serverless approach uh, with Camel K. 
Camel handles several hundred different types of integrations. You can do file integrations, mail integration, you can even do Twitter integrations and anything sort of in between there. Uh, it's an easy way of doing transformation enrichment and it handles a lot of enterprise integration patterns. Um, it also sort of integrates readily with a, part, uh, a sort of, sorry, <laughs> Kafka Connect. So um, it's a great way of sort of mating these two together. Uh, and our next speaker, Klaus Ibsen, who is sort of the king of Camel, will actually dive deeper into the aspects of Camel and Camel K. Yeah, well, Ica has been running Kafka for a while now, and some of the uh, larger initial products are already running on top of Kafka. Uh, the focus now continues on actually handling smaller integrations and doing this in a repeatable and easy way. Uh, and we will move on sort of phasing out more and more of a legacy integration platform. But the time is, I guess, running up. So let's take a look back and summarize uh, sort of the key takeaways here. Well, we can see that Kafka runs really well on Kubernetes. Um, it takes the burden off handling the complexity. So we can actually focus on the value driven aspects, uh, just telling how we want things to sort of act and react and uh, all the small different pieces are handled automatically. Uh, the distributed nature of Kafka and its ability to scale makes it a, a, great com a, a great candidate for handling asynchronous messages for the whole enterprise. We can have sort of one big deployment and we can handle everything from one place. And it sort of uh, goes well with this ICC. It can also be uh, a good way to hide complexity because Kafka can be quite complex, but by sort of owning it in the ICC and handling a lot of integrations from there, we don't actually need to sort of show this complexity to the whole organization. And for sort of integrations uh, with uh, more specific demands on transformation and handling, uh, we can leverage this with Camel K and make a real lean integration sort of layer on top of Kafka. So if you want to make an integration, you can sort of run it uh, with Camel K. If you have a more complex messaging uh, sort of project, you can, uh, what do you say? Um, use the, the performance of Kafka in the underlying layer. Well, yeah, uh, that's sort of everything I've got. I guess you all have questions, so let's uh, go through those. Um, thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Gustav, and uh, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Um, we have received one question from the comments field, and I think uh, I suggest that we start with that. Are you ready? I think I am. Yes, there is a question from Kayug. Uh, does StreamC add autoscaling features to a Kafka cluster? Autoscaling features, yeah. Um, good question. Uh, at the moment, I would say no. So you won't have autoscale sort of fully automatically taking care of, of, of this. Uh, it's really easy to actually scale your cluster. I mean, in the part of where you actually tell streams how many brokers you want to take care of the load. Uh, what would be a little bit bigger step is that you often also want to sort of uh, repartition. Uh, so you actually take your partitions and put them over to the new brokers as well. Uh, this is not hard, uh, but it's usually a, a few steps. And at the moment, StreamC doesn't sort of handle this automatically, but I foresee it coming in the future. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. And uh, and I, I suggest that you uh, uh, you can answer in the comments uh, comments field uh, uh, after this as well. Um, sure. Uh, and uh, I would uh, uh, please uh, um, continue to ask questions. There is a I think twenty second delay, so so the we will we will read up the questions when when we see them. Uh, but uh, so Gustav, can yeah. I ask you? Um, what, sure. How did you go about scoping the POC scope? Is there anything to think about there? Yeah, well, that's a good question because we had a POC and we tried to keep it pretty short. I think it was uh, spanning a month, but we sort of uh, did uh, the work once a week and then we sort of let Ika do things uh, behind the scenes involving developers and trying stuff out. Uh, so it was quite a small POC, uh, but we, we did mention sort of the important stuff. And then new things arrived. I mean, this Cloud First initiative wasn't at all part of a POC. Uh, but I, I don't think we would have liked that in the POC because it, it's getting a, a lot bigger pretty quick. Uh, so I would say a key take is to actually do the POC really quick and focus on the important stuff. For Ika it was actually sort of evaluate performance, the size of the cluster and those things. Yeah, I guess you must have had a lot of aspects also like with regards to cost and so on to, to try out the right setup of technologies, right? Yeah, that's right. And we had the sort of a, a discussion with different vendors uh, through the POC as well about uh, which sort of platform or product to actually choose from and price versus performance of those. And I have another question, Gustav. Uh, what about, uh, you have a pretty good uh, team going there and you have a good culture that keeps the talent onboarded. What, what are some of the, why do, you, why do you think that is and how did you go about that, that part of the equation? Well, I, I think uh, Sort of, if you look at the, the use cases for this, we didn't at all need to sort of uh, move to the cloud or uh, even uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, but we were able to show the benefits of going that way. And I mean, the, the management was really keen to listening to us and sort of getting our approach on things. So I would say the whole project has taken longer time to actually execute because of this. But the whole organization has also learned from sort of our makings and our trial and errors uh, since we were pretty early into this cloud first initiative. Mm -hmm. And I would say that have paid off. Uh, I mean, we did our thing, we did it well, and it was a lot of fun on the, on the journey as well. Thanks. Uh, we got another question from Bjorn. Uh, uh, what do you think about Kafka streams from an integration point of view? Uh, well, yeah, I think Kafka stream comes with a few really strong benefits. Uh, you can actually sort of, if you get data into your Kafka cluster uh, and then Kafka stream is sort of still, it's, you're inside the domain. Uh, then you have the ability to do things like exactly once and pretty easy sort of shuffle this data around and reach it, uh, transform it. So I would say uh, if you have those use cases, uh, you should definitely take a look on, on Kafka streams because uh, I think you will sort of make things a whole lot easier uh, by making Kafka handle this pretty advanced stuff. And finally, I guess also, what has been the most fun with the, with the whole uh, uh, venture? <coughs> I, I would say uh, moving uh, sort of to the containerized world. Uh, it's really nice to see what, it, what the benefits are and that we actually sort of got where we thought we will uh, be without too much hustle, I think. Uh, it works really well and uh, I mean it's it's a fun work. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, before we continue, we have another question from Max. Uh, what kind of use cases has been implemented implemented with Camel? 
Well, uh, I would say we have... No, sorry, Camel K, sorry. Camel K. Um, we have uh, just started sort of a journey with Camel K, so it's a more of an architectural question at the moment. Uh, we are looking at sort of a legacy integration platform and seeing that uh, we are in a big need of sort of handling different types of integrations, uh, what do you say, uh, quite sort of easily and in a lean perspective. Um, so that's why we're looking at Camel K, but we haven't actually any use cases running uh, in that sort of order yet. And, uh, sorry. We're just reading up on the yeah, questions here as we go. Yeah, but I think there was no more questions for the moment. Thanks a lot, Gustav. And uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Klaus, Ibsen, Klaus Ibsen from Red Hat. And he will, he will speak about middleware and integration architecture modernization. And uh, Unfortunately, Klaus is uh, not joining us uh, live here at the studio today, but he will, he, he will be online answering your questions. But uh, after his, uh, his session, we will come back, come back here and uh, discuss his session together here. So next up, Klaus. Hello, and welcome to this presentation about best practice for integration architecture modernization with Apache Camel. My name is Klaus Ibsen and I'm a software engineer from Red Hat. Um, I've been working on Camel for a long time as the tech lead, wrote a couple of books on Camel. Uh, I'm from Denmark and currently live in Denmark, but I have uh, lived for 10 years in Sweden, in Malmö. So yeah, it was near Denmark anyway. So in this presentation, we are mainly talking about Camel, but you know, how Camel has progressed over the time from you know traditional uh, enterprise um, ESP systems to uh, modern cloud native. So before we start, what is Camel? Uh, well, Camel is the Swiss army of integration. It's one of the most active products at Apache Camel. It's been active for over 12 years. Uh, it's actually a giant Swiss army knife with a lot of functionality. So what do you use Camel for? You use it for integration, so to integrate different systems, you know, and then you can use Camel to plug in between and glue the systems uh, together. So Camel is a Java-based integration framework. It has great runtime support for many of the great runtimes you know today with Spring Boot, and we're gonna see about Quarkus, Java E, MicroProfile, and so on. It's based on um, the ideas from a book called the Enterprise Integration Patterns, and it comes with a lot of components, which you can think of like Kafka connectors. And you mainly use um, a DSL, which you can write in Java XML to define and describe how systems are integrated in camel routes and it can integrate with almost everything and speaking of routes here are two examples very simple one is just a straight one-to-one -one integration between a file and a DMS queue so in Java code you just say from file to DMS and in XML you can do the same at a runtime it doesn't matter from camel it becomes the same on a load so just to give you a quick overview of Apache Camel 3 and the products we have here, which will be relevant for this uh, presentation. So we have Camel, which is the Swiss knife of integration. Then you can run Camel on Spring Boot. And then we have Camel on OSGI. And then the following three we're going to focus on in this presentation is Camel K for serverless Camel on Kubernetes. Then we have Camel Quarkus, which is a, a fast Camel, also native compiled with Graal. And then at the end, we talk a bit about the latest product, Camel Kafka connectors. So let me just spend a little time talking about the evolution of integration from the lens of Camel. So um, over 10 years ago, this was the Camel website. This is the oldest I could find is from uh, January 2009 and this was our website for a long time but today we have an, a modern website. 
So back then, uh, many years ago, it was based on the principles of Sora. It was good principle with contract first, uh, do service coupling, uh, reusability, and, and composability, and then so on. But it tends to be this centralized software and teams where things they become a bottleneck. It's not um, designed for chains, and it's not cloud friendly. It's not uh, immutable containers and all that kind of things. So, uh, if you look at an architecture from back then, this is a very very old one. Uh, you may not know it, but it's the, based on a specification called JBI. So there was a product called a passive service mix that was created create around this specification and service mix and was one of the you can say fathers to camel so inside service mix there was a routing engine and that became camel uh, uh, today's esp architecture is based on primary based on uh, runtime with osdi called apache Carafe, and then you can have uh, many camel applications running in, in one giant jvm you know kind of like a monolith um, but in recent time, microservice architecture has evolved, and you know, where it's more like a sort designed for chains, you know, individual teams, bounded contacts, and all that, yada yada. Um, you know, SOAR 1.0 based on 12 factor and Netflix stack, and so on. But, and here in, in Camel, um, we saw people picking up that and, uh, you know, primarily using Spring Boot to build uh, the different uh, microservice with Camel. Uh, so we say this is microservice 1.0. And you can do that today with Spring Boot and Camel. And, but lately, and what we're gonna focus on in this presentation is focused on cloud native architectures. Well, you know, we have a infrastructure that can aid your um, applications so you have the application concerns separate from the infrastructure concerns so the infrastructure take care of networking and security and discoverability and many other things so it's truly cloud native and how can you design or uh, camel applications or integration application in cloud native you can still use Spring Boot, but Spring Boot is becoming a bit of a heavy bottleneck there. And you run those in, in when I say cloud, I mean Kubernetes, and the concept in Kubernetes is to package your application into a, a pod uh, as the deployment unit. And in the pod, you can maybe in recent times start to use uh, service meshes. I'm not gonna talk too much about service meshes, but it's, uh, it's about uh, networking. Uh, it's, you can also, not use service mix and avoid that but this was probably in the beginning we see service mix become more and more key component in the infrastructure and it's also a part that you can get in in the latest versions of uh, openshift um, if you are also building integration application you don't need spring boot you can just use camel uh, we have something called camel main for that and also there is a great product uh, quarkus and this is really, really an awesome product. I, I encourage people to take a look at. And Camel uh, works great with Corvus as well. And then uh, serverless architectures, uh, we have a very exciting product called Camel K. As I'm uh, happy to present to you today. You can run on uh, in the Kubernetes with and without uh, Kinetic. And speaking of serverless, what are some of the requirements for running serverless? So in a serverless uh, platform, we want to be able to scale quickly up to and down the pace ba based on demand because we only want to service request and, and when there's demand for it. So we should have rapid scaling, but also very important, we should be able to scale to zero. Uh, so there's no cost of having the service on the platform when there's no demand for it and the platform should have a vending and routing so the service can you know pass uh, data uh, using events and, and be able to have the reli reliable routing and networking on the application side of things they put some requirements to it that the application should 
uh, be able to start really fast, but also be able to give a fast first time to response, which you're going to see later. And also your application should not be bloated in, in, the, in the containers in the cloud. So they should have low restrictions on memory and CPU and this size as well. And here are some of the products that could build, uh, that could give us all that. Of course, on the platform, we're talking about Kubernetes, OpenShift, and Kinata. But on the application side, you know, I'm really proud to say that we have Camel K and Quarkus that can really deliver those on, for example, with Java technologies. And speaking of Camel K, so what is that? So I really like this phrase that is a lightweight integration based uh, on Apache Camel born on Kubernetes with serverless superpowers. So it runs on vanilla Kubernetes, but you can of course also run it on OpenShift and it gives you the best if you have Knative. So what is, but how do you do that? This is what CamK is all about. You know, there is a trend where developers just want to focus on dealing with uh, business logic and not deal with run times and all that kind of things. They just want to integrate systems and go serverless. So what they can do with Camel K is to write Camel routes in a single file. So what we have here is a Camel route written in, in for example, um, Java or Groovy. So it is a telegram. So every time there's a chat from a telegram, we do some custom transformation, send a message to a Kafka and take the message from the Kafka and say, call it HTTP service. Then we can say uh, camel run. Uh, camel K comes with a command line tool called camel with a K. So we say camel run and then the name of the file. And then Viola, it, it runs in the, in the cluster. So how does that work? So this is the high level architect of camel K. So on one side we have the development environment on the other side, we have the cloud environment. And when I say cloud, it can be local. You can run the cloud run on your laptop, like with Minikube or Minshift, something like that, or you can run on the real cloud. So what happens is that as a developer, you use your environment and you write your code, and then you use the tool to uh, update your code into the cluster. And this is done. Kubernetes allows to extend itself using something called a custom resource definition, CRD. So what we've done in, in Camel is to create an integration custom resource. And then there is an operator, Camel K operator, that reacts on these uh, changes to the CRDs. So it listens to all the custom resource definitions that are related to Camel and integration. And then the operator has all the logic. This is where all the smarts is. So the operator figures out what to do. So it takes your code, look at it, figures, okay, what set of dependencies and runtimes and whatnot do I need to make this run? And it figures out what to do. And it can do it really fast. And we're going to see a slide here. And, and this was one of the key goals of CAMK was to also to be able to run it really fast. So one of the issues with running uh, applications on, on containers is that you have to, every time you do a change, you have to rebuild the container image because, and that takes time. And those are the red, yellow, and green bars here. And those are different depending on, let's say, with an Okay. Thanks for the presentation, Klaus. Um, we have not received any external questions yet, but uh, I can, could give the word to you, Gustav. Do you have any, any comments to add on the, the upcoming things on Camel? Well, yeah, thank you, Klaus, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, I feel it's really nice to see that, like you say, Camel is 12 years old right now. I have, uh, for myself, uh, been working with it for 10, and. It's nice to see now with Camel 3 that things are really happening and it's still staying strong, staying on top. Uh, I mean, all these new features is really exactly what you, what you want when you start to sort of move your, uh, your systems to a, a new cloud-based or maybe containerized uh, sort of zone. So really nice to see. Yes. Would you like to add anything, Max, before we continue to the next session? 
No, we had some fun in the in the break here in between, uh, recollecting some of the Camel implementations we've done over the years, <laughs> and it's uh, fun to see, uh, great to see that it's still a solid uh, technology. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is about uh, perhaps the next speaker, if we're ready for that. Uh, we were going to discuss uh, disaster recovery on Kubernetes. Unfortunately, Rashid uh, has uh, sick kids and couldn't be with us tonight, so. Uh, that session is still available for anybody who has interest in that particular subject and we'll, we'll be happy to come back to you with that. We'll put up an email address again in the commentary field in the next, during the next session. So, so get back to us if you want to that content. And then back to you, Eric. Yes. <coughs> uh, we, we also received uh, a comment, uh, comments here that the presentation was uh, ended uh, a bit early. Sorry for that. I think uh, Klaus was uh, about to wrap up. Uh, his session anyway. But uh, for the next session we have uh, Hasim from Stackater who, would, uh, who will talk about Kubernetes uh, the hard way to manage at Scania. So welcome up Hasim. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hasim and today I am going to take you through the journey of Scania and how we uh, built our system using Kubernetes the hard way and then we migrated or are migrating to a managed Kubernetes setup. Uh, so let's start a bit about myself. Uh, I am a DevOps engineer and a full stack developer, also known as uh, Kubernetes Ninja as we call it here at Stagator. And I, I've been working with Scania for quite some time now where I'm part of the platform team which is responsible for maintaining, creating Kubernetes-based platform uh, to be able to support applications uh, at Scania here. Uh, uh, let's start off with a little background about the project I'm working with. It's uh, basically we work in the domain of after sales. It's uh, it, it's a application which supports uh, which supports the service advisors and the technicians in the Scania workshops all over the globe. And it, may, it makes their work efficient and helps them in their day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, looking at the technical side of things, uh, this is sort of what our architecture looks like right now. We, are, uh, we heavily use microservices. We, we use uh, micro front ends, we use other related technologies such as Kafka for communication between microservices. And of course, everything is containerized and deploys, deployed to Kubernetes clusters. Uh, today, we will focus on only on this part of, uh, of our platform. I won't go through the rest. So, uh, which brings us to what, what led us to use Kubernetes in the first place. So when we started this project, we wanted to be agile, we wanted to be able to deliver new features uh, continuously, we wanted to be customer centric, to be able to react to their feedback as soon as possible. We wanted to have zero down downtime in our product because it's, uh, it was supposed to be used all over the globe. So all of that led us to the choice of Kubernetes. and. We were lucky in this way that uh, it was a new project. We didn't have to migrate old existing legacy systems to, to the cloud. So we were, we were born cloud native. And, and then we had the opportunity, opportunity to use the services offered by Kubernetes. Okay, moving on. So <laughs> where did we start? We started with Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, for, for those who have ever tried Kubernetes the hard way, they would agree that this uh, pictorial representation is sort of true because uh, Kubernetes itself is a beast and doing it the hard way is, of course, not easy as the name says itself. So, uh, when we started back in 2017, I think, there wasn't, there wasn't any standard managed service offered by, by the cloud providers or any other company at that time for Kubernetes. And there wasn't a de facto installer, standard installer for Kubernetes as well. There were a few, but uh, not mature, I would say. So we decided to go with Kubernetes the hard way instead and uh, set it up manually ourselves. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, we, we built the first setup using Terraform infrastructure as code. We automated the whole setup uh, through pipelines. And it took, a, it took us a while to get the hang of it, but it came out good. And when we first started building clusters with it, I think it, if I'm not wrong, it took around 30 to 40 minutes to set up a single cluster. But uh, we started off with that and started development for our product on that version of Kubernetes, and it 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 went out good for us. And then, uh, as soon as we realized that we need to scale to be able to make it production ready, we wanted to have multi we wanted to have a multi master cluster. So we hit our first problem right there. Uh, I don't exactly remember what what the exact problem was because it's been some time, but it when we were trying to set up multi-masters, there was an issue with, with the default CNI, uh, which was KubeNet, I think, and it used uh, AWS route tables at that time. So we figured out we, we, we would need to have a custom CNI installed, and then we installed Weave on Kubernetes the hard way, which wasn't easy, of course, even though guys at Weave have made the installation pretty simple. So it, it was hard and soon we realized that uh, it's not only tedious to create a cluster this way, but to maintain it was, was not easy at all. And we realized that we, it would be difficult to scale it. S but uh, yeah, so we thought of moving on to other possibilities, but I still believe that uh, the time we spent on Kubernetes the hard way, it really paid off. It took us some time to get on the Kubernetes bus using this uh, method, I would say. But at least once when we were on it, we could go ahead on full speed. Um, uh, for, uh, for anyone who hasn't tried Kubernetes the hard way yet, I would recommend that you give it a try just for the sake of learning because it's, uh, it's, like, the, it's like the holy grail of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so moving on after, after this attempt, we evaluated some we evaluated some installing tools such as COPS, Cube ADM, Cube Spray. And for us, it turned out that COPS seemed to be a good fit. It was quite popular at that time as well. And it was, uh, we were impressed on how easy and quick it was to actually set up clusters using COPS after Kubernetes the hard way, of course. And I think the best part about COPS was its singular cluster.yaml file, the config file we used to create or configure the clusters. It was a single file to set up the whole cluster. And even setting up a multi-master cluster was, uh, was simple in the YAML file. And the CNI was like, I think, two lines of uh, code in the cluster.yaml. And it was, it was very easy to scale it up uh, to a multi-master cluster, and then also to replicate and scale into different clusters as we did when we started with COPS. And the solution is uh, or was pretty future-proof. Uh, we're still using it. We're still using uh, our clusters on COPS. It's, it's, I think it's still the best way to create a cluster if you're creating it yourself. And yeah, and the cluster or YAML, the best thing we liked about that was we store every configuration in Git and we uh, deploy all our clusters through pipelines, uh, not just by CLIs, even though COPS has a good CLI. But it was really easy to incorporate into pipelines. And for us, it was, it was the best fit and it still is. Uh, but eventually, uh, we are now planning to uh, move on to a more managed solution so that we can, so that we don't have to take care about all the underlying architecture of Kubernetes, the things running on the master and the underlying operating systems. So we are looking into uh, a managed solution and we're thinking of, uh, we're thinking of going with Amazon EKS because we are already based in AWS. So it seems to be a, the best choice for us right now. So first we tried out EKS with Terraform. E even though Terraform has first class support for EKS, 
uh, we quickly realized that it's, it's, it might not be the best way to create a cluster using uh, Terraform, create an EKS cluster using Terraform. So then we explored EKS CTL, which is now, I think, the standard way to create a uh, Kubernetes cluster using EKS by Amazon itself as well. So we're on, we're on that right now. And uh, yeah, but yeah, I think ma the managed service has its benefit, but it has its limitations as well. Uh, if, if you want to customize uh, the Kubernetes installation, it's pretty hard to be able to do that because of uh, a lot of restrictions. Uh, for example, we wanted to have a custom OIDC authenticator and authorize, authorization for Kubernetes cluster as we already have with the COP solution. But it's not as simple to set that up with EKS, I would say. Uh, yeah, so moving on, what do we have in the future? We plan for having minimum dependency on AWS as well, even though we are AWS native right now. But we strongly believe that the future will be a hybrid cloud and we don't want to lock ourselves down to one cloud. Even though, we're not, even though we don't have uh, clusters in multiple clouds right now, we're still integrating with services that are deployed to IBM Cloud and, uh, and Azure as well. So I, th I think this is going to come pretty soon in our pipeline in the future. So uh, that was about it. That was our journey uh, at Scania with Kubernetes. And if you have any questions regarding that, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Hasim. We have we have now received some some questions in the some questions here, but they are very from from what I can see they are very case specific. So uh, Hasim will will answer them as soon as possible uh, directly in the in the in the comments field. Uh, or Sorry. Yes, yeah, Azim will answer the questions there. Uh, and I also have to say sorry for the technical issues with, uh, with Klaus presentation, uh, very unfortunate. And uh, before we wrap up this, do you, would, would you guys like to add something? Well, I, I can add that uh, we're very grateful for any feedback you'd like to give us, and we're very grateful for your participation as well. It's, it's good that we can overcome some of these uh, challenges with not being able to be together in the same room. Uh, so we have some plans going forward with uh, GCP and uh, machine learning, IoT, and smarter cities. That might be one theme we'll do up, up and coming here. We have another theme around micro front ends. So, if you have any other ideas or any ideas that play into those themes, uh, please uh, email us and, uh, and we'll try and get you involved and engaged uh, when we do this coming up. We still need to learn and have some fun even though we're sitting at home most of the days. <laughs> uh, so that, that should be good. Uh, apart from that, I just want to thank you all for participating. It was a lot of work for us to try and uh, rearrange everything. And, and uh, again, we apologize if, if uh, every detail was not perfect, but uh, we'll make them perfect next time. So, so thank you all. Thank you all.